recording. Um, let me remind uh, the students that um, there's going to be an uh, interesting colloquium tomorrow at 3.30. Um, the subject uh, is basically um, the threat of nuclear war. Um, and there's also going to be a public talk at eight o'clock in Moom 101, Woodward Hall. Um, Woodward Hall uh, 101 is a huge room. Um, and I, we, we picked that room um, so people could um, socially distance and not catch COVID or the flu or common cold from each other. Um, unfortunately, um, we are probably not going to Zoom the public talk, but we will Zoom the colloquium. Um, but the colloquium Zoom uh, link will not be the uh, one for this class, but will be one for the regular colloquia. Um, there'll be an announcement about this um, by email uh, on Friday, um, tomorrow. Um, anyway, the speaker, Ted Postel, um, or Theodore A. Postel, is a, um, an MIT professor uh, who's been working um, uh, in um, nuclear and uh, strategic and uh, military uh, applications for many years. And um, uh, he's uh, worth listening to. Um, so I, I urge you all to, uh, to attend. Um, let's uh, go back now to um, the principle of stationary or least action in, um, in a field theory like classical electrodynamics or quantum electrodynamics or quantum field theory, the standard model, whatever. Um, what you have is um, the action is an integral of an action density or Lagrange density integrated uh, over all of space and time. And um, the principle of least action is what we went through the last time. You've probably seen this many times. You, you want to say that the first order change in the action vanishes and the first order change is proportional to the change in the the first order change in the in the fields and their derivatives. Here we just have for simplicity a single field. Uh, here uh, a is summed from zero to three. Um, I uh, should have yeah it says so a summed from zero to three, um, and uh, so we then. Um, uh, integrate by parts and um, we drop the surface term here typically because we um, are asked we're we're free now to ask um, what to, to set the change of the action to, to first order equal to zero um, for any uh, variation and um, in particular uh, to a variation delta phi that vanishes at infinity. So we drop the surface term. And what we get is Lagrange's equations, namely the partial of the action or Lagrange density with respect to the field is the eighth derivative of the partial of the Lagrange density with respect to the eighth derivative of the field. And A goes from zero to three. Um, and this this gives you the classical uh, equations of motion. And um, we went through that uh, last time. 
what what's into uh, the, the next topic is is the role of symmetries in field theory and symmetries typically lead to conserved quantities and um uh, and and the idea here is where we're imagining that the lagrange density is unchanged because of a symmetry when the fields and their derivatives change by changes that need not be small. And uh, so if we assume that this vanishes and then we apply Lagrange's equations, which is, says that the partial of L with respect to phi I, I just labels the field, um, is the eighth derivative of the partial of L with respect to the eighth derivative of the ith field. Um, then uh, we have this expression here. Now you notice there's a dA here and a dA there. And so combining them, we have that what zero is the sum of d, uh, the partial deriv derivative with respect to xA of this sum. And this sum involves the change in the field and these partial derivatives. Um, and what that means is that this thing here can be considered, is, this thing here is, is a four vector that has zero divergence. And we call such a thing a current. So the current is the sum over the fields of the, um, the partial derivative uh, times the, um, the, uh, the change in the field, the change in the field being the change that uh, leads to uh, no change in the Lagrange density because of the symmetry. So this delta phi is the, is the, the change in the fields that respect the symmetry basically. And since that has zero divergence, the integral of the zeroth component over a volume is conserved in time, or at least its time derivative is minus the uh, integral of the divergence of the current. And uh, that then is a surface integral. And we imagine that this surface integral is outed in spatial infinity and um, if that's the case, then uh, all the fields, if there was zero there, then the current is conserved. And as I said to you um, last time, the, the for maybe Monday, the uh, quantity whose conservation is known most accurately is in fact the uh, conservation of charge. Um, and so what we have then is this charge, which is the integral over V of this uh, charge density then is uh, conserved. And um, um, we can write that in terms of pi I, where pi is the momentum conjugate to the field. Um, an example, I think I went through this on uh, Monday or maybe Wednesday, um, is an action density that has, uh, in, in an action density in which you see this, this action density is quadratic in the field, in the derivatives of the field and the field. So it's like R squared and under a rotation about the origin, um, something that's a sum of squares doesn't change. And the, the uh, change in the field that, um, that corresponds to a rotation is uh, given by, it says uh, you take an anti-symmetric matrix and uh, multiply the fields by the anti-symmetric matrix. Here, we're gonna use an epsilon, a small number, because, um, the change in the i field is given by this sum only if it's a small rotation. If it's a big rotation, then you need, frankly, sines and cosines, and it's all kind of elaborate. And um, so what we get is that this is equal to zero. And um, uh, 
and the result is that the charge associated with the matrix A, which is pi i, change of phi i, or pi i a i j phi j, summed over i and j, integrated over some volume, that's conserved for all of the anti-symmetric matrices, and there are n, n minus one over two of them. Um, uh, now, the, 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 the next topic is, excuse me, the um, uh, typical case of the action density or the Lagrange density being independent of position. And that's normally the case in our theories. We don't have a, an explicit X here. So in other words, what, what we're talking about here is, um, is that L is L of the fields, the derivatives of the fields, but no, but that's it. There's no, there's nothing else there. There's no position uh, variable. So in other words, we're not talk. Uh, there's there's no explicit derivative. The the partial of the, of L with respect to any particular A is um, going to be zero. Um, um, or, or to put it differently, it depends, the derivative depends upon, uh, on XA's only through the dependence of the fields uh, upon XA. And so what we, what we do here then is, um, what we do then is we, we then use Lagrange's equation to substitute for partial L partial phi i, and that gives us this structure. And so altogether we have zero is this, and this is the, uh, this is the, to, this is the, the dependence of the field on, uh, or the Lagrangian on a uh, Lagrange density on XA and um, putting it all together, then we have D by DB of this thing, this whole thing is a, is a B divergence. And then we put in partial, partial XA with a Delta BA. And that tells us then that the quantity in the square brackets has zero divergence. And the quantity in, this, in the brackets well, there are four of them because A goes from zero to three. And um, so in particular, um, the time derivative then of the um, four momentum um, is equal to the uh, amount of four momentum that's coming in through the edges and so in other words, this is conservation of energy and momentum. If we want to do conservation of angular momentum, well, then what we do is we focus on the Lagrangian itself or the spatial integral of the Lagrange density. It's unchanged under rotations if you have um, rotational symmetry in the problem. And then once again, using Lagrange's equations, um, replacing this by the eighth by basically this structure here, um, what we get is, and this d by dA acts on the whole thing actually. So um, this, this thing was zero is equal to partial A of um, partial L, partial partial A phi B phi, so the, 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 the d by d phi is in there. And um, so then the um, what you have is that the time derivative of the angular momentum, which is the partial of L with respect to the phi dot, um, uh, times the change that respects the symmetry. And the change that respects the symmetry is x cross gradient of phi. 
Um, the idea there is the change in phi due to rotation is the gradient of phi dotted into how x changes when you rotate the spatial coordinates. And that's theta cross x. And then, you know, you can fiddle with the, the um, you know, in other words, you've got in, in these cross products, you've got, or dot cross product, what you have is um, grad i of phi epsilon i j k uh, theta j uh, x k. And that's the same thing as um, everything the same, but j k i. Let me get rid of this thing here. Um, and that's the same thing as um, epsilon uh, kij, and I'll just put a ditto there. So um, that's that's what one that's what I did going from from here to there to there. Um, and this tells us that angular momentum is conserved. Now. Um, the change in a field component, though, if the field isn't a scalar field, but it's a field with several components, like the field for an electron or the field for a photon, then um, the change in the lth component of the field is not simply theta dot this, but there's also a term that has to do with the spin of the field. And then the conserved angular momentum is this because it's this, it's it's this delta phi l delta phi uh, for each component that has to go in there or in here, and so this is the angular momentum for a field with spin. Um, I think I've said this twice that the momentum of the uh, of a field that's canonically conjugate is this just this partial derivative anyway if you can invert these equations and express uh, phi dot in terms of pi then you can rewrite you can write h which is defined as pi i phi i dot minus l um just in terms of phi and pi and they, that's the form of the hamiltonian you do that for a scalar field, you get h is pi squared over two plus grad squared over phi over two plus m squared pi squared over two. There's something amusing here having to do with strings, um, namely that the um, action density for a string is something that involves uh, the um, time derivatives of the coordinates of the string. This x is an, is an n vector because we're in some n dimensional space and we don't really know what n is, might be 10 or 11 dimensions. And um, uh, x prime is the derivative with respect to sigma, which is the path length on the string and uh, derivative with respect to t is uh, the time derivative is a derivative with respect to tor, which is, so to speak, the time of the spring. Anyway, it's of this form. This thing is homogeneous of degree um, two here, and the square root means it's just ordinarily uh, um, uh, just a homogeneous uh, function of uh, degree one, the first degree. And so you apply Euler's theorem let me just bring up Euler's theorem that looks like that. N here is one. And so you get that um, the, uh, the energy density is just identically zero for this sort of uh, string um, theory. Um, let's, let's switch now to nonlinear differential equations. Um, they, they're particularly interesting because each solution has its own size and shape and form and so forth. And um, so that's attractive. Unfortunately, you can't add solutions together and get other solutions. And, but, and so you have to either guess the right solution or figure it out somehow or integrate numerically. Um, one case that's 
uh, that one can be done is what's called the Riccati's equation. And there you get, this is the solution. Then there's an equidimensional equa equation um, that looks like this. It has a solution that's given by that. That's a general solution with a constant, two constants. And then there are two special solutions. Um, and these are detailed in a book by Bender and Orzog uh, that came out oh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Hydrodynamics. I, I think it's worth going through this at least quickly. Um, it provides examples of um, partial differential equations in physical context. Um, the continuity equation for a liquid or gas of a mass density rho, a velocity v, and a current density j, uh, and the volume v bounded by a surface s is, well, the time derivative of the mass, well, it's the mass flowing out of the, um, or minus the amount flowing in. No, it's the amount flowing in, which is minus the amount flowing out. dA is pointing outward from the surface that encloses, encloses, the, sur encloses the, the volume. And um, uh, this um, is effectively the divergence of rho times the velocity. So it's the, it's the um, divergence of rho v uh, integrated over the volume. And so the differential form of this is rho dot is minus the divergence of rho v and uh, this is then rho, the divergence of V minus V gradient of rho. And so the total time derivative is a partial time derivative plus this thing here, V dot grad rho. And um, this is sometimes written as just minus rho divergence of V. Um, and if both sides of this continuity equation vanish, then the fluid is said to be incompressible. Now, um, in, in, in um, actual physical applications, um, we don't mean that the fluid is literally incompressible, just that the compressibility of the fluid is negligible. And that's typically the case for, say, water, or, some, or um, another fluid, typically it's um, the compressibility is negligible and that's what's meant by inc incompressible. Um, the pressure integrated over the surface exerts a force on the fluid and um, that's equal to the gradient of the pressure integrated through the volume. And um, if you set that equal to the that plus the external force act, uh, acting, uh, and you set that equal to mass times, well, force is the, the mass density times the force. Um, what you have then is, is uh, mass times acceleration is the force, and the force is minus the gradient of the pressure plus whatever the force density is. This the row is here because it's sort of an abstract force and it's it it's often proportional to the mass density. Um, that's certainly true for um, uh, gravity. It's proportional to the force, proportional to the mass density. Anyway, um, if you have a fluid of of uniform viscosity eta and uniform bulk viscosity zeta then um, you, you have a more elaborate equation, which is um, described by uh, the book by Federer, described in the book on mechanics by Federer and Walechka. I don't think we need to uh, go through that in detail. Um, if the fluid's incompressible, which means that the divergence of the velocity 
uh, of the fluid vanishes, then um, you can write the Laplacian of the, of the fluid velocity um, in this way. And then the fluid obeys a simpler equation due to Navier and Stokes. And um, that expression looks like this. And now, um, it, when the speeds are slow, when V is slow and you have what's called laminar flow, as opposed to the chaos of whales splashing around, but if instead you imagine that the flow is, is, is very slow, um, then um, uh, in that case, you can uh, drop these uh, V terms. And, and this, is, this is characterized by, laminar flow is characterized by low Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is the density, mass density of the fluid, the velocity of the fluid, the size of the, uh, of the inhomogeneity in the fluid or the object that's disturbing the uniformity or the uniform flow of the fluid. And it's divided then by the uh, viscosity. And um, uh, so if you, if you imagine let us say the uh, movement of a microorganism, a multi-celled uh, animal, but uh, you know, with a small number of cells, less than a thousand or so, um, in water, um, then um, this Reynolds number is much, much less than one. And if you're looking instead at uh, even more closely, you're looking inside a cell, then inside a cell, um, the distance L is so small and the speeds are so slow that uh, the Reynolds number is, is, is essentially zero when you can neglect, neglect inertia terms. Um, you then get a simpler equation and it's linear in the velocity and it's that the gradient of the pressure is the mass density times the force density minus the viscosity times the curl of the curl of the velocity. In the case of gravity, the force is just G times Z hat, at least near the surface of the earth we're talking. Uh, that has no divergence and no curl. And um, the curl of a gradient vanishes, the divergence of a coral vanishes, and the curl, the curl of the curl of a curl also vanishes. And so we get these two equations um, for low, uh, for uh, laminar flow. Um, so inside a cell, for example, it's zero is grad squared uh, Laplacian of the pressure and the Laplacian of the curl of the velocity also vanishes. Um, I applied those in this example to viscous drag to de de derive Stokes's formula. I don't think we, I'm, uh, the reason I did that is that it's relevant now in during this pandemic uh, in which um, the, the virus is transmitted largely through the air. And um, the key thing here is um, that the drag uh, is six pi um, times the viscosity and a and God, I just I didn't re read this in detail today. A, I what is a? I forget what a is. Sorry. Um, it's a radius or a. This is really stupid that I've forgotten what A, oh, radius A, there we are. So it's the radius. And um, so the drag is uh, six pi A eta. And um, what actually happens if you then apply this, uh, you use this formula and you imagine what happens to a, um, a very, very small particle in the atmosphere. And it turns out that these 
very small droplets of say water or spit with virus particles inside them. In other words, what happens when you cough or you sneeze or you just breathe and you're infected? These things are called uh, aerosols and they float in the air for days or weeks. Um, and uh, if, if the if you're in a humid environment, it turns out you're kind of safe because the the uh, you, the small droplet of aerosol droplet of water attracts water molecules from the atmosphere, and if the atmosphere is very humid, then uh, there's a big accumulation of water droplets, and you eventually get a the virus trapped in a, a drop of water which falls to the ground. Uh, uh, I mean, it could be as rain, or it could just be that it's a heavy aerosol and it falls in a matter of minutes or hours. Um, on the other hand, in New Mexico, the the um, humidity is so low that these aerosols stay in the air for a very long time. On the other hand, the sun in New Mexico is so bright that um, I think the UV destroys the virus particles. Uh, in the air. Anyway, it's basically you're basically safe outside in the air, um, but indoors you're not safe. There's an example here: the speed of sound. Um, here, what you do is you linearize the equations. You imagine that there's a fixed pressure, a fixed mass density, a fixed velocity. You go to the frame where the velocity is zero. And you're just looking at change in that frame, the change, the velocity in the, in the frame in which the velocity of the, the mean, the average velocity is zero. The, the velocity then is just delta V. And then um, in Euler's equations, um, this simplifies to this over here and the continuity equation simplifies to that. And you combine the two and you get an equation um, for the second time derivative of the density um, goes as uh, Laplacian of the uh, change in pressure. And, um, well, let's just say that if you, that, that basically you can impose an adiabatic condition, namely the P times the velocity to Race to the not the velocity, the volume raised to the power gamma is time independent. It's a constant, and uh, you then find a uh, a wave equation where the speed or the square of the speed is gamma uh, u squared over three, and um, u being the average of the squared velocity of the molecules in the gas. Um, so the speed, it turns out then the speed of sound for an ideal gas is the square root of this, and it's around 349 meters per second for molecular nitrogen, I just say N2, at um, 20 degrees. Uh, um, that must be Celsius. Um, okay. Um, there's a chat. Uh, window open here, and you can um, say things on it if you want. Um, let's now switch to um, another application, namely nonlinear differential equations in cosmology. These are partial differential equations, typically. Well, they start out as partial, but we then turn them into ordinary differential equations. On large scales, our universes homogeneous and isotropic in space, but not in time. At least this is what we think. Um, we know it's not homogeneous in time. Um, anyway, the invariant squared distance between nearby points is given by something that's the metric. And this is normally written as uh, ds squared is um, g, let us say, gij dxi dxj, and we're summing i and j from zero to three. 
So that's that's what the metric is. And um, here in in um, in cosmology, we take the metric to be basically uh, diagonal um, in most cases, at least for cosmology. And um, in spherical coordinates, it looks like this. Um, of course, uh, Einstein's um, uh, one of his many contributions was to show that uh, you could write the equations of um, gravity uh, in ways such that uh, the equations look the same when you make general coordinate transformations of them. Um, in other words, you say xi prime is some xi of, uh, is some xi prime of x0, x1, x2, x3. And as long as this, these four functions, i equals 0, 1, 2, 3, as long as these are effectively one-to-one -one and smooth and so forth, um, then the equations that Einstein introduced um, are what is said to be uh, generally covariant. That is to say, the equations are invariant under general coordinate transformations. That was one of Einstein's mainly uh, contributions. Um, here, um, when we write the equation this way, we typically think of R, theta, and phi as what are called co-moving coordinates. Um, and um, in other words, they, um, they're just the coordinates that imagine you have a big black balloon and you're writing on it with uh, white ink then um, you might when the balloon is a certain size you might write a grid on the surface of the balloon but then when you blow it up um, the markings change uh, swell by a the um, scale size the scale parameter and um, the scale factor is what it's called. And uh, the markings on the balloon um, then have numbers associated with it. Those numbers are what we call r, theta, and phi. But the actual physical distance associated with those numbers swell with the scale factor. Um, anyway, you apply Einstein's equations, um, then, and by the way, where do Einstein's equations come from? Well, you write down the basically the simplest theory involving um, the spatial coordinates and uh, this uh, metric um, gij. You write the simplest action for, for the theory. And um, then you apply the principle of stationary action, and then you get Einstein's field equations. And if you also specialize to a metric that's diagonal and has this simple form where L is some huge number, um, then you get um, what are called the Friedman equations of general relativity. And they're two very nice uh, equations. One is second order in the scale factor. One is... Um, just first order in the scale factor, but it involves the square of the scale factor. Um, and uh, here rho is the mass density, P is the pressure. K is a number zero, one or minus one. And uh, L is that huge number. G of course is Newton's constant, which is one over a Planck mass squared essentially. And um, these equations become a lot simpler if rho and p are related. And um, let me see, my dog wants to, I don't know, he wouldn't want to lie down on the bed. So I'm going to put that out for him in case he does. Anyway, um, if rho and p are related um, by an equation of state, like p is c squared constant w times rho, then. Um, these equations simplify and um, can in fact be solved. 
um, typically um, uh, there are three important special cases. W equals a third is radiation. W equals zero is matter. And W equals minus one is dark energy, which is to say that space itself has an energy density. And if you double the volume of space, you double the energy of the universe. Um, the In chapter 13, which I hope we'll cover in the latter week or two of the course, um, conservation of energy then gives um, mass density as uh, a constant times a certain power of the scale factor, the scale factor of the power minus three or one plus W. Um, notice then if W zero, which is matter, it's just saying that the mass density goes as one over the cube of the scale factor. And of course, that's what you expect. On the other hand, if W is minus one, then the mass density of the universe is just constant. And um, that's the dark energy case. Anyway, um, expressing rho in terms of P and more P in terms of rho, you get the Friedman equations take this, these forms, this and then that. And now there are some examples that are work out to be pretty um, simple. Suppose you have a universe dominated by a cosmological constant. And frankly, um, the present view of the universe, which in which we have dark uh, energy, and by the way, that was um, the Nobel Prize for finding that was shared by uh, Adam Rees, uh, who gave a talk, who Zoomed us a talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, Perlmutter, at, who's at Berkeley, and a guy named, oh God, I forget his name. Anyway, Schmidt, I think. Um, uh, so if, uh, and, and if that's the true universe, then um, um, in another few billion years, we're going to be, have a universe dominated by a cosmological constant. And the equation of state parameter will be approximately minus one and Friedman's equations will just be of this form. If the energy density the dark energy density is, or the mass density of the universe is negative, and K is minus one, then the scale factor satisfies a harmonic equation, A double dot is minus lambda squared A, where lambda squared is this. And then the scale factor is a periodic function, and um, the nonlinear differential equation, the nonlinear first order equation, in other words, one of the Friedman equations, uh, fix the magnitude of um, alpha uh, to be C divided by two lambda L, um, uh, lambda being related to Newton's constant and the dark energy density, let us say, and um, L being that huge number which characterizes the size of the universe when K is not zero. K equals zero is a flat universe. Um, and um, so then the solution is um, basically that the scale factor is a sign function of time and it goes up and down and up and down. Uh, the scale factor can become negative because only a squared appears in, uh, is physically relevant. The sign of a doesn't matter. Um, and uh, this is a maximally symmetric space time and it's called anti de Sitter space. Um, when, when the mass density is negative, there are no k equals zero or k equals one solutions. Um, if the mass density now is positive or the dark energy density is positive, then the square factor obeys a uh, harmonic equation and um, where this frequency squared is um, this positive number. And then we have an exponentially expanding or contracting uh, 
scale factor. And um, the nonlinear, the Friedman equations give us this, and you can then solve for alpha and beta, and you get a cosh and a cinch. These are three different solutions according to three different values of K. And it turns out that they all actually remarkably represent the same maximally symmetric space time, and that's known as de Sitter space. And uh, over here, I plotted out these de Sitter, uh, de Sitter spaces and anti de Sitter spaces. The anti de Sitter one was the oscillating universe. And um, um, this um, is kind of a bouncing universe. And um, so is the de Sitter and the anti de Sitter. They're all bouncing universes. And um, uh, that, of course, is a, a possibility. Um, and it's one that has been developed and studied by a professor at Princeton, Paul Steinhardt, and he's going to give a colloquium in May. Um, and he's, it's going to be an in-person colloquium. Um, and um, this, it, there are many, there are advantages to that. And it's it, one advantage to the bouncing universe is that um, if you take the de Sitter or anti de Sitter universe and just pollute it with a little bit of matter, then um, that's the present universe that we have. And um, so, you know, uh, now I guess that's not quite our universe because the pollution with matter and radiation is fairly significant at uh, times close to the Big Bang. And so the Big Bang, uh, so the de Sitter and anti de Sitter universes aren't very accurate at um, uh, near the Big Bang. And um, what Steinhardt has done is to uh, repair that uh, problem. The, the alternative, of course, is inflation. But the, the problem with inflation is you have to imagine that somehow there was, um, well, I mean, one theory of inflation is that in that shortly before the Big Bang, in fact, very shortly before the Big Bang, there was a fluctuation of a scalar field or perhaps several scalar fields in some tiny volume of space. And that fluctuation was to a value uh, or to values of the field at which the, their potential energy was enormous. So you had, in other words, a potential energy density that was absolutely enormous at, a, at just because of a quantum fluctuation, you had a spatial energy dense, uh, an energy density that was enormous in a tiny volume of space. Well, then Einstein's equation tell you that if you have a high energy density in a tiny bit of space, that little bit of space is going to expand like crazy and it expands exponentially. In fact, it looks like this, alpha e to the lambda t. And um, and um, so boom, it uh, it expands, and you see this this thing that is doing the expansion. It's Newton's constant, but times the mass density in this tiny uh, volume, and so that's the picture. But of course, um, you know, it's. I mean, is that more pl plausible than a bouncing universe? I don't know. Um, it's it's these are scientific questions to be um, settled by uh, more study of the, uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, other aspects of the universe. Um, for a universe in which the mass density is entirely due to radiation and in the very near the Big Bang, it was almost entirely due to radiation. Then W is a third and the Friedman equations look like this. If we choose R to the fourth to be related to Newton's constant and the mass density in this way, um, this is the mass density of the radiation. 
then and um, we set k equals zero for simplicity, then these are the the Friedman equation is very simple. It's just r squared over two a, and that gives you two a dA is r squared dt. You integrate, you get a squared is r squared t. And the k equals zero solution then is uh, a is r square root of t. So the universe expands at early times, uh, like, it, well, it always, if, if we assume we had a big bang and so forth due to inflation or whatever, this, um, the universe always expands as a square root of uh, t for small t. Um, uh, Let's see, do I have a graph that, no, I don't. All right, so this is, this is what we've got. Um, this is the present 14 billion years. If the universe had only radiation, then the scale factor would have increased like this. On the other hand, if um, you have only matter, well, it, um, it starts as the square root, but then it goes as the two thirds. And if you have dark energy as well, then it starts growing exponentially like this. And so it's e to the t here. This is, two, whoops, this is t to the two thirds and this is square root of t. So um, let's see. So this is, oh, Jesus. The, this is the, um, uh, let me go back to what it is that I was talking about here. So here we have a, a universe of radiation. And what we've got is that this is going as, um, for small, now I'm, I'm puzzled because it almost looks as though this is going as T, whereas it has to go as square root of T. So there, there might be a typo here. Um, Um, let me just get this out of the way and get back to full size. So, um, oh, all right. I, I think I see what's going on. What's going on is, is this is a small parameter altogether because L is huge. So it's the cross term here that has a T in it. And then you take the square root of that. And that, that happens in both cases. Over here, you see it's the cross term that's important. The T squared term doesn't um, matter. And if you have a K equals one universe, it reaches a maximum size, um, uh, even if it's a, matter, a, 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 a universe of radiation, it um, increases like crazy, but then comes back, uh, collapsed to, to zero. And um, uh, I must say that that's not apparent from looking at this. Um, oh, it is in this case, I guess. Um, all right, I, well, in this one, as T increases, when it gets big enough so that, well, all right, forget it. I don't, I'm, I'm gonna have to check that. There could be a typo or two there. Anyway, the, the idea here is then that a universe of radiation, if K equals one, then it uh, collapses back to zero in about six giga years. If you have a universe that just matter, then you have W equal to zero and the Friedman equations look like this. And um, then it increases as K to the, as T to the two thirds. And um, that's thought to be a reasonable approximation to the first few giga years of the present universe. Of course, L squared is so huge that this term, the coverage term is, is, is negligible. Uh, the scale factor reaches a maximum size of k equals one, and the maximum size looks like that, and then collapses to zero. There's something called kination. That's a universe in which the kinetic energy density, uh, the energy density is dominated by kinetic energy, and um, one then gets um, that the 
mass density is one over the sixth power of the scale factor. And uh, let's see, have we seen, I guess we've looked at equation, uh, we've looked at figure seven, six, uh, seven point five. So what we believe is that the solid curve is our universe. Um, but again, um, it could be that this is resulting from our bounce. Um, and um, it's also true that what you call the big bang is um, sometimes it's called one way, sometimes it's called the other. Um, if you imagine that you have a bouncing universe, then the big bang is the time near the bounce when the universe was very, very dense and hot. Um, if you think it's uh, the universe is due to inflation, then um, what happened was the high potential energy density caused the universe to expand like crazy. But eventually the scale of fields that were at crazy values looked at each other and said, we are at crazy values. Let's go back to our normal values. And then they turned into radiation. And that radiation was the big bang. So there, there are two different ways of thinking about it. And the, the inflationary period is between the quantum fluctuation and the time at which the scale of fields just um, uh, give up their potential energy as radiation and go back and relax to so the normal values that they would have. Um, I must say, every time I talk about these things and think about these things, it seems to me that a bouncing universe is much more plausible. I mean, there are just so many things you have to assume in order to get inflation to work. Uh, but again, it's a scientific question. We have to see what fits observations most closely and what uh, theory has to say about the inflation. Um, if we go, and, and that would come there from particle physics uh, to, to some extent. And um, the equations of particle physics, like the equations of so many areas of physics are nonlinear. And um, so physicists use perturbation theory to cope with the nonlinearities when the coupling is weak. When the coupling is strong, they have to actually do the path integral. And so what they do is divide space time into uh, a four dimensional lattice and uh, just numerically integrate the path integral. And um, this turns the, uh, in, in the original, uh, uh, implementation of that um, by Michael Kreutz, who also was given colloquia here many years ago. Um, Kreutz constructed a 10 to the a, a four dimensional lattice with 10 points in each direction. And that meant he had 10,000 points um, representing the universe. People now using supercomputers use. Um, uh, lattice with more points, but the trouble is that the number of the number of integrations you have to do goes up as the fourth power of the number of points in each direction. And so it's hard to go from 10 to 20, and then it's still harder to go from 20 to 40. And um, so this, this is not a trivial business by any means. Um, Sometimes, though, one can say, well, let's, instead of emphasizing the quantum aspects to the exclusion of everything else, let's, um, let's try to, um, let's treat the fields classically and um, get to the quantum aspects later. Frankly, um, I think that would be a, a really nice approach in some ways, but I'm, I can't, at least at the moment, I can't recall a single paper or uh, ex uh, case in which people said, well, we're going to solve the classical equations and then in kind of a perturbative way, as a second approximation, we're going to do the, we're going to put in the quantum fluctuations. 
Um, that might be a really interesting way to to deal with um, uh, the strong interactions. Um, and it certainly would be, would give more understanding. Whereas when you do these, when you numerically integrate the path and oh, you just the machine chugs and chugs and chugs and then gives you a bunch of numbers and you don't really know, you don't really understand what's happening typically. Anyhow, um, here's an example of a, um, uh, a nonlinear theory. It's a theory in which you have, let's go to one space, one time dimension, which actually is the case of string theory. Um, and uh, you put in a potential term. And um, if we use prime to mean spatial derivatives in the single dimension of space and a dot to be time derivatives, V some function of the field, then the difference the partial differential equation looks like this. Of course, it's linear on the left-hand side, but this can be whatever. And um, then you can, you can, this though is a partial differential equation. And one way of dealing with it is to say, well, maybe the field just depends upon X minus VT. So it's some um, lump moving at a constant velocity. You then have um, phi dot is minus v times the derivative with respect to of the field with respect to u. So phi and phi of x t. In other words, what you're doing is you're saying that phi of x and t is really phi of u, which is phi of uh, x minus v t. And then you have this relation, and then this equation simplifies to one minus v squared. The second u derivative of phi is uh, the derivative of the potential with respect to the field. And if you multiply both sides by the uth derivative of the field, um, you get this equation. And you can then integrate that because the left hand side is 1 minus v squared times a half the square of the uth derivative. And on the right-hand side, you get V plus a constant of integration, which we call the energy. And once you have that, you can solve for phi sub U and, um, uh, and then you can write uh, DU is equal to this times, uh, or, or rather D phi is such and such times DU. And then you write DU as this times D phi and you integrate. And um, once you do the integrate integration, you have phi as a function of u, and um, or you have u as a function of phi, but then if you can invert that, you get phi as a function of u. An example is the um, soliton of the five-fourth theory. Um, I worked on this actually many, many, many years ago. Unfortunately, I didn't publish it. Uh, which was archly stupid. Um, and um, anyhow, uh, so if we take this to be the action density, this is, uh, this is a little bit like the Higgs density, by the way. And it says that phi wants to have a, uh, an average value of phi zero. And when it strays from phi zero, um, it, um, there's a cost in potential energy. Anyway, if you then uh, apply this um, formula for u, you get that u is equal to uh, this integration. And this is an, you can do this integral exactly. This and it's the inverse hyperbolic tangent of phi over phi zero. And so then you get an expression that phi of u is this, and this is u minus u zero. And this is a soliton or an anti-soliton moving at constant velocities. The word soliton, I think, um, dates way back more than a hundred years. Um, some English physicist was noticing that in the canals, um, or maybe the irrigation, channels, you, you could have a wave that would just 
go along and it would have a constant shape and it would just keep going. And um, in fact, I think tsunamis are like that. You have a constant shape and that thing just shoots along the surface of the ocean. Um, and um, by the way, the New York Times has a story, well, I mentioned it's in many papers of um, people have done, uh, published recently a computer simulation of what the effect of the asteroid that hit the planet in the Gulf of Mexico, maybe created the Gulf of Mexico, um, uh, 66 million years ago, I nearly said billion, 66 million years ago. And um, basically, uh, wiped out a lot of, um, well, they wiped out the dinosaurs apparently, and the only things that survived were, well, I don't know, I'm not a geologist or a biologist anyway. I think what basically survived were things like mice. And so we, um, in some sense, um, my great, 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 grandfather was a mouse. Um, and, uh, anyway, um, MATLAB, of course, can solve differential equations. And here's an example. Um, you say, you, you tell it that you have certain things that are symbolic variables. You say you have an ordinary differential equation that's dy dt equals ay times one minus y over some constant. A constant is y of zero is y zero. You then say you're going to call your solution y sol. So you say that's d solve of ode, which you defined, and cond, which you defined. And uh, then it tells you uh, what, well, then you say y sol is simplify of y sol, and then it gives you a nice solution. This turns out to be the solution of the logistic equation, uh, which um, is something we talked about uh, earlier. So this was a first order nonlinear equation, second order linear ordinary differential equation. You say SIMS, the condition is that, the ODE is this. Um, you then say u sol is d solve of that. And then, so in other words, you're, you're telling, you're asking MATLAB to, to call the solution u sol of x, and then you ask it to simplify u sol, and it gives you a Legendre polynomial. What do you know? Um, um, a second order ODE with two equations. You say u of x uh, and x condition one, condition two. The ODE looks like that. U sol is d solve two conditions simplifying. You get sine x over x. That's the spherical Bessel function. And um, one of the things that's very nice symmetries are our friends, um, and um, in particular. The standard Bessel functions describe physics in it with cylindrical symmetry, and they're very complicated functions. On the other hand, the spherical Bessel functions describe physics that has spherical symmetry. And these are quite simple functions. For example, J0 is sine of x over x. That's, that's a pretty nice function. Um, let me show you something having to do with MATLAB. Um, and so let me bring it over here. I rewrote the MATLAB program. In fact, I yesterday, one of the reasons why I um, wasn't as prepared as I like to be for the lecture yesterday was that I was talking with MATLAB, I called MATLAB, because um, I found that when I had simply a for loop here and I looked at um, the activity monitor, which is this thing here, um, I found that MATLAB was only using about 5% of the CPU. And I thought, well, this is stupid. I want to be using 99%. Um, 
In fact, if you write a Fortran program and run it, or a C program and run it, you're going to use 99% of the CPU if you're not, you know, using it, using the computer for other things. And um, so the the guy at MATLAB said he'd look into it and get back to me. And what he got back to me was a very useful um, uh, observation or information. Instead of a for loop, for n equals zero to 10,000, you say par for n. And um, what that means is that MATLAB runs the program runs the execution in parallel. And down here you see, it says starting parallel pool, par pool using the processes profile. Well, I don't know what that is, but anyway, a uh, number of workers 10. So apparently it's using what are called 10 threads. And if you click on this, you see this thing has been running for 16 hours since two o'clock this morning, which is when I started it. And um, it's still running. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, I think if I had run this in Fortran, it would have been done uh, long ago. But anyway, here's, well, maybe not because this thing is running in parallel, but it's still only using half the CPU. If I look at the activity monitor um, for MATLAB, 10% well, of the CPU. So this is 9% basically. Um, this, I don't know, this strikes me as Really quite strange. Uh, also, I'm a little puzzled as to why this is one colon O3, as though it's been running. Well, maybe it's a day. Uh, yeah, I guess it's that I started MATLAB over a day ago. Anyway, um, the point is then that um, you can use uh, PAR4. So when you, you run MATLAB, use PAR4. And depending on how many, what your CPU is, you'll get a big advantage or a small advantage. Um, but it'll almost certainly, if it's a modern laptop, uh, you'll certainly get a decent advantage. Um, so we've now finished this uh, chapter. And of course, the next chapter is um, integral equations. and um, here, um, this is, as you may have noticed, a much shorter uh, chapter. And um, actually, before saying that, let me remind, let me just mention something that um, I may have. Uh, I think I, I think I probably forgot to mention this to you. So let me get back to differential equations. Um, I'm going to go here, but only to go backwards a little bit. You see this R squared um, in the in the book. It's there's a typo. It's just R T. It's actually R squared T, and um, so that's uh, an error. Um, and you you should look at. Um, uh, the uh, errata, uh, or the errata, the the PDF of errata um, for the second uh, edition of the book, and it's um, if you look at the class web page, uh, up at the top of the class web page, there's a link to the uh, errata, and in fact tonight what I'll uh, try to do is include this errata in the errata. Um, so that's basically it for, t for today. Um, I would once again urge you to um, go to the, 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 the colloquium tomorrow at 3.30 with Ted Postal is going to be in person. And then at eight o'clock in Woodward Hall in their giant room 
101, uh, uh, Post, uh, Professor Postal is going to give a talk about Ukraine and the th threat of nuclear war. Um, one of the problems here is that um, young people, and I guess that's everybody listening to me now, um, and I'm stretching young people to mean people 40 years of age, or even 50 possibly, these people um, have largely forgotten about nuclear weapons and they behave and think as if there were no nuclear weapons. And um, that's fine when we have good relations with China and good relations with Russia, but the United States has treated Russia very badly, except during the Second World War. And uh, we've started to treat, Trump started treating China badly and we've treated China badly uh, for the last five years or so. So we have a, we have tensions existing. And um, when you have tensions, especially the tensions with Russia, the possibility of nuclear war is not any longer zero. And um, so it's, it's um, really worrisome. And, um, and in fact, the Russians don't have a very good early warning system. And so if there's a flock of birds or a failure in one of their computer chips that suggests that there's a nuclear attack and, and our war with Russia fought with Ukrainian soldiers in Ukraine continues, the general in Russia may say, geez, this is it, I'm pressing the button, or he tells Putin what the situation is and Putin says, go for it. So, um, so I urge you then to go to the colloquium and to go to the um, evening talk. Um, the university is, is, uh, has, has become very frightened of Zoom bombing. I think that's um, not a problem. I think it's only a problem if you're in one of the minority groups that constantly gets picked on, then um, you're in danger of getting picked on by a Zoom bomber. But um, people basically ignore physics departments and physicists, and so we're not likely to get Zoom bombed. But the university's scared, and so we probably will not Zoom the evening talk by postal. So you should just come to Woodward uh, 101. It's a gigantic room, though, and so you can socially distance um, quite um, quite easily. Um, and uh, as I said, his talk should be worth hearing, um, will be worth hearing. Um, and uh, the, the colloquium is also in person. We probably will Zoom the colloquium and um, stay tuned for the link and uh, um, passcode. As, as I said, the because UNM has become hysterically frightened of Zoom bombing, uh, we aren't um, publishing the, I've been told not to publish the Zoom content, uh, can, uh, coordinates and uh, we're not even, unless, unless we make a change in the next 24 hours, we're not gonna Zoom the evening talk. I think that's too bad, but that's the way it is. All right, I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody then. Um, have a nice weekend and hope to see you at the colloquium. Let me see if I can end the Zoom session. In fact, I may have ended it already. Where? Yeah, oh, no, all right, I'm gonna stop share and